This is From the Courtroom to the Boardroom, the podcast for the next generation of legal leaders with me, Simon Gibson. I was a lawyer for 13 years until I walked away from legal practice and entered the world of business. I'm now CEO of the Spirant Group and I lead a portfolio of businesses in the UK and Australia. On this upbeat podcast, I tackle the big issues facing law firms and businesses alike with the help of intriguing guests. Are you ready to rewrite the script? Then it's great to have you along for the ride. Hello friends, Simon here, hope you're well. We're talking artificial intelligence in the legal sector today. When I started my legal training, what I got on day one was a big pack of standard letters, I got a dictaphone, and I got a load of tapes. Remember them? But now we're seriously facing emerging technologies which can automate so many processes, including reading documents, including researching, and even forecasting the outcome of legal matters. So there's loads going on, there's loads developing, and I want to find out some more about it, about what, where the tech is now, about what is realistic in terms of the future, and about how it might affect the role of the lawyer and the business of law firms as we move through the next years. I'm certainly gonna need some help in terms of analyzing these issues, and I'm delighted that our guest this week is Dr. Catriona Wolfenden. Catriona is a partner at Waitman's, the national law firm, and she's also the product and innovation director across the whole of the firm. Catriona is gonna be talking about her own experience, about the projects she's undertaken at Waitman's, and we'll also be talking about the future for artificial intelligence in the legal sector, and also some of the uh, emerging technologies away from AI. Uh, Kat is a really, uh, really great guest. She's a really excellent expert. I know she's going to add a lot of value to this discussion because effectively, what I want to work out is whether artificial intelligence is an emerging technology which can help lawyers and law firms have happier clients, work more efficiently, and earn more money, or is AI just the latest buzzword to get bums on seats at legal conferences? Well, we're going to find out. It's going to be really a great debate with Dr. Catriona Wolfenden, who's on the podcast straight after a word from our sponsors. Podcast today is brought to you by Zeus Tech Solutions, who provide dev on demand for law firms. When I was managing partner of a law firm, recruiting and retaining top tech talent was one of the biggest challenges. And we're still, because we didn't have the knowledge in the business to manage and coach a technical team, it was a constant cycle of frustration, downtime, lost revenue, and proclaim line dormant. Well, for the past five years, Zeus have looked after both of Spiring Group's law firms in the UK and Australia, and it's been a game changer. Now, we get all of our tech on tap, from IT director to .NET developer, we get that whenever we want. Zeus provide the best use of tech to all of our fee earners with no recruitment fees and absolutely no nonsense. So if you're a law firm who are frustrated with the tech anywhere in the world, go to www.zeustechsolutions.co.uk and hit the live chat option and the answer to all of your tech solutions, however specific they are, is right there. Better still, if you mentioned that you heard about Zeus on the podcast, you will get a free health check for your case management system. So that's Zeus Tech Solutions, Dev On Demand for law firms, and now on with the podcast. Hi, Kat. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thanks so much for doing this. No problem at all. So we've got to start with how you became a product and innovation director at Waitman's. Have you, have you got a legal background? Yeah, so I suppose I've got probably what's fashionably now called a squiggly career. So I suppose I was an accidental lawyer um, and then kind of fell into innovation. So I started at Waitman's about 15 years ago um, as a paralegal, qualified as a solicitor, um, didn't really want to spend my life doing that. So moved over to knowledge management before taking up innovation about four years ago and then product um, and innovation this year. And were you always uh, a lawyer who had an interest in tech? Um, I suppose not necessarily the tech, but the processes and the kind of the ways of doing things. So 
I suppose I always saw law pretty much as a process. You know, we've all got procedural books and that kind of things, haven't we, to set out what we should be doing. So I always knew it was it was capable of being put into a process. I quite like a list, a um, bit of a flow chart, that kind of thing. I think I've always thought kind of in, um, you know, those kind of mind maps, those kind of things. Um, so not necessarily the tech. And in fact, my husband laughs because I'm not really the um, the tech one um, at home. But I suppose just that that interest in doing things a bit differently. Yeah, I completely agree, Kat. Uh, law, no matter what the area, it is a process. And I think that there's such a diversity of appreciation amongst the the, the legal profession as to the uh, the, the uh, value that tech can bring. And it's, it's great that you reached that conclusion early on in your career. Just before we get stuck into the issue of artificial intelligence in the legal sector, when you're um, implementing change in, in Waitman's, whether that's a project or whether it's a new process or, or a new piece of tech, what, what, what are the main important focus areas that you need to bear in mind um, when you're managing that change effectively? Yeah, so I suppose implementing change in a legal um, arena is quite difficult. Um, I think lawyers, as, a, as probably as a broad group, are probably quite um, reluctant to change. They've always done things in a certain way. They've had an awful lot of training that kind of set them up for that. Um, I think the main thing to, to, to remember when you are implementing change is the people factor of all of this. So you've got to win the hearts and minds um, if you want people to adopt um, either, you know, technology or a new process, whatever it might be. And I suppose that goes really back to basics and thinking of like the innovation adoption cycle and recognising that not everybody will be at the same stage as, as you are or, you know, as a, as a group won't all be at the same stage and actually leading people through that kind of cliche journey. So being really, really clear on what the change is, why it's coming in, what the benefits are, what the limitations of it are, so what the tech um, or the process will do, and equally what it won't do as well. Yes, that's right. And it's it's what it was always one of my frustrations when I was leading a law firm, when uh, tech companies made a pitch to me, insofar as what it, it could come across sometimes, particularly if, if, if it was a product, was that their main interest was just saying what the product can do rather than applying the functionality of the product to the expectations and, and the wants of the end user. And, and, and in a law firm, the end user is usually the fear. Now, sometimes it can be the client. But I think it's, it's, it's the expectations and the mutual benefit that tech can bring to that end user that should be the focus rather than just talking about the functionality of the product or the system. Yes, I think that, that's a good question, Simon. I think managing change in a law firm environment is particularly difficult. I think lawyers are probably quite a sceptical bunch. And I think you've got to really hammer home not just what the change is, but what the benefit or the reason for doing it is. So why it actually impacts that lawyer or um, secretary or whoever it is whose life is going to be kind of changed by that. And I think it's really involving people from the very beginning and remembering the kind of hearts and mind, minds battle has to be to be one, and I suppose when you start rolling out projects and products, it's quite difficult because obviously you're probably at the more evangelical end of it, wanting to get the change out and that kind of thing. And then you've, you're faced with quite a sceptical, um, you know, questioning and argumentative audience, as as lawyers often are. Um, and I think it, it's recognising that, you know, there is that change cycle and that people will be at very different stages on that change cycle. And that's not necessarily anything to do with you. That's just kind of where they are in terms of, you know, dealing with change themselves, um, managing new technology and that kind of thing, change in the workplace. Um, and it's to bring those people along on that journey with you. Yeah, it's bringing them along. That's the key, isn't it? Absolutely. So we're talking artificial intelligence today, this particularly um, interesting area of technology. It, it seems to me that since, since the first case management systems were introduced into the legal sector, that there's been a, a general direction of travel towards, first of all, standardization, and then automation has gradually emerged. And I think it's fair to say that there is a whole range of different objectives that law firms have there. One can be to um, drive down um, uh, the payroll cost to increase efficiency, 
Another can be to provide clients with a better experience, obviously profitability, all of these things sort of well together. But ultimately, I think there has been a quest to drive as much automation as possible. And I guess, I guess the absolute panacea of automation would be where we could get a machine to learn enough to replicate or to um, or to synchronize how a lawyer or, or, or a person would, would behave in a legal environment. But let's, let's think about where we are now. From your perspective, what is artificial intelligence in the legal sector as we, we speak today? Yeah, so I suppose the kind of the law tech, legal tech that we're talking about um, is not your core system. So it's not things like your document management, your billing, your CRM systems, your Outlook and, and Office things. It's the extra technology that sits on top of that. So kind of the newer, um, more groundbreaking things. So like you've mentioned, AI, so machine learning, using data um, and then having algorithms trawl over that data to tell you things that basically you didn't know about it before. Um, that could then be used to help either make decisions or to benchmark or to help set reserves or whatever it might be. Um, I suppose at the other end of the scale, so that can often be quite black boxy where you don't know what how, how a decision is being made. And that obviously for lawyers who are very used to being able to explain why a decision has been made is a real kind of, it's a really difficult thing for them to, to grapple with because you know, lawyers like to see the reason that explainability is really important. And that's one of the reasons, I suppose, why when we look at tech, we we in particular focus on what's the explainability, what's the audit process behind it. So it's not like those, you know, computer says yes or no. We don't just want to know an answer in a vacuum. Um, I suppose at the other end of the scale, you've got things like chatbots and stuff. So quite um, almost routine technology, I suppose, in other industries, but relatively new um, in the legal in the legal sphere, and then I suppose then in the middle, decision support tools, those kind of things, um, expert systems. So almost kind of trying to codify the best kind of legal knowledge there is into a system that's scale scalable and repeatable. Um, and then the automation bit, Simon, which you you picked up on. I mean, all of these kind of innovations and products are really geared at one thing, aren't they? So that client drive. Um, to be more efficient, to get speedier resolution of things, to get a, a lower price. That's kind of all where, where the legal market is kind of geared at, is trying to service that client demand and to do that in the most cost-effective way as a law firm as possible. So that is using things like automation when automation can do the job um, that a person would otherwise be doing far, far more effectively. So, I mean, you know, Simon, we both spent time in, in practice. Nobody qualified to want to go and key data between systems, did they? I mean, it's frankly really boring. So being able to use bits of technology to actually do that in the background and to move that data between systems so that you can actually do the job of lawyering, um, you know, is, is where where lawyers want to be. So a real, I suppose, a mixed bag in terms of, of AI in, in the legal sphere, and I suppose we're probably just starting to see, um, you know, how it how it beds down into practice and how lawyers start to, to use it. Yeah, it still is relatively early days, isn't it? I, mean, I think the most straightforward um, example of AI would be, for example, a machine which has learned to read certain documents, if it was a contract, if it was a, an expert report, and to extract the key points from it. That, that's something which has been around for a little while. I, th I, think, I think most lawyers are quite comfortable with that, where it gets a little bit more contentious or a, a little bit less certain is where, as you say, the, the, the machine, the, the tech is actually involved in the advisory process or the decision making or a degree of sort of forecasting of outcomes. And I wonder just if we go back to what you were saying about, about the client in this, you mentioned the, for example, the chatbot um, technology, which again, it's not new, but it's certainly fast developing in terms of what the extent to which the uh, the tech at the front end of a client matter can play in the in the full journey. Do you think clients? And I know at Waitmans, obviously, you've got a wide range of clients from sort of institutional clients and corporate clients to to, to private clients. But as as a rule of thumb, do you think clients care whether it is a human who was walking them through those early stages of the journey or later parts of the journey? Or are they, or are they just as content 
if that is somehow systemized or driven by tech? Yeah, I suppose it, it, to give a lawyer's answer, it depends, Simon, on the on the, the area and the client. But we've got some good examples, I suppose, here where it's not the kind of the AI, but it's more the technology. So clients really want easy access to things. So whether that be to, you know, letters within a case management system, whether that be, you know, KPIs, so how much they've spent, you know, um, time spent on a matter, that kind of thing. And what they want is not to have to email a law firm and say every Friday, can you send me a spreadsheet that's got that data in? They want to be able to get that data whenever they need it. So, you know, if they wake up at 11 o'clock at night and they've got a board report to finish, they want that information to be there to be 100% up to date and for them to be able to slice and dice it in the way that they need to for their for their own kind of clients and stuff. So, you know, I think you mentioned document review. That is relatively, I suppose, in the in the grand scheme of things, older technology in, in terms of AI and innovation. But I suppose even still, you've got within that as a sphere, we all know that that kind of technology is better on some kinds of document than others. We know that it involves a lot of human input to train the models to be able to be used on new areas and stuff. So, you know, there's still that kind of lawyer input that needs to go into to all of these technologies, even the ones that are a little bit more embedded, I suppose. That, that's a really interesting point about the fact that it's difficult to find pieces of tech, even now, which don't require some form of expert involvement. And one of the things I, I, well, one of the things that used to frustrate me when I, when I was leading a law firm was that the importance of having the right technical team in house to actually implement the product or the project and to lead that heart and minds exercise that you, you mentioned was often undervalued and certainly with other law firms that I, I speak to now. And um, there sometimes is the approach that a product should just be purchased off the shelf. That's what you're paying your good money for. And that should be the end of it. It should simply be dropped into a law firm. All of the users should love it. And I think the trick that's being missed there is that the quality of your technical team, whether that's an in-house team or whether it's something which is outsourced, that will dictate not only the quality of the implementation, but also the value that the user and the business will get from, from the tech itself. Is, is that something you that resonates with you? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I suppose you see in my role, I see, you know, literally hundreds of demos over the course of the year. The better demos are the ones that kind of focus particularly on the type of challenge they think you're going to have. The best ones to then purchase are the ones that follow through with that implementation and adoption um, kind of user experience piece at the end. It's not just by the technology and goodbye, you passed on to, to somebody else never to see them again and stuff. And I think that that point about, you know, buying technology and it not just fitting in is probably indicative of a wider problem with a lot of all the innovation and that kind of thing, which is unless you've sorted your underlying process, and to quote my boss who hammers home, you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Unless you have got that really, really clear and nailed at the beginning, then anything you throw on top of a process is just going to make it more chaotic. It'll make it faster, but you'll have faster chaos. So it's that point of really kind of stepping back, having a look at what the problem is, what the process is to date, why it's been done that way, what different ways there are of doing it, and then fitting the people um, and the technology into a new process. Yeah, spot on. It's it's about the what 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 is the end game you're trying to achieve through implementation of the tech, not just implementing tech for the sake of it. What tell me about what it's like? Because obviously the, the two options that a law firm has who might be listening or watching the podcast who's thinking, you know, some of this is really important. We we, we must raise our game in terms of how we embrace or artificial intelligence or tech generally into the practice. The two options they've got is they either invest in in-house resource or that they outsource to an agency. And obviously Waitmans have been bold. They've, uh, they've backed um, the importance of tech. They've, they've brought you in as leader and, and, and your team around you. What, what, how would you compare having that in-house experience 
to an external agency? Yes, yeah, so I suppose the, the benefit of doing all of this in-house is I suppose we know the people and we know that people are so important in, in innovation. So actually understanding the characters and the things that motivate them or might detract them from using certain things. So we almost know the levers to pull um, and manipulate to be able to get, um, you know, kind of use cases through and that kind of thing. Um, I suppose, you know, Waitman's did take a punt four years ago, but that was a very much, a, I suppose, a small punt at the beginning. And that's probably the message for for other people listening at different firms in that we started this really, really small. Stuart and I both had full-time roles that wasn't weren't anything to do with tech or innovation. And we just both got interested and started to chat and do bits literally in the evenings and at weekends, kind of, you know, spare time moments. Um, and it started to kind of build from there. We were, you know, we saw an awful lot of demos, an awful lot of good ones, an awful lot of rubbish ones, and we picked quite carefully. But we started and scaled that up really small. And it's a bit, you know, it, it just builds momentum then. So the technology and the use cases and the problems we tried to solve early on were ones that um, mattered to particular people. So there was that real buy-in from the lawyers involved. We also picked some stuff that firm-wide mattered. So things like filing emails and stuff, we knew if we could solve that, then we'd got most of the firm on side. So to try and show stuff that was quite quickly an early win um, to build that bit of momentum um, and get it get it going as well. So I think there's often this myth that you need, you know, millions and millions of pounds to start dipping your toe into all of this. You know, you don't, you attend a few conferences, you know, buy a few books, go to a few webinars, that kind of thing. There's plenty to get you started before you've committed any um, great amount of money into it. That's right. I mean, there's a couple of things there I'd just like to, to, to respond to because, I mean, the first point is that um, this issue of the pace of change is, is critical. And I've made mistakes around this in, in the past when I've really believed that we have the opportunity to improve something. I've perhaps... Um, uh, I've perhaps used my own passion and my own belief in a project and sought to imprint it onto everyone. And, and that, that's not smart in terms of managing any sort of change. So that slow, incremental steps, measured improvement, mutual benefit, that's the way any change is managed well, and, and certainly in terms of implementation of tech. The other point which really resonated with me is that I think legal is quite a niche sector. And for whether it's an in-house team or an agency, what I would say is to any law firm thinking of um, bringing new tech into their business is you need your team to understand what it is lawyers do. You need them to understand what their processes are, how they make money, what their clients' expectations are, what secretaries want, how it's easier for them to work, what's going to annoy them. If you don't have empathy and experience of what legal teams want, I think any tech is going to be a hard sell. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think as well, it's not just picking and talking to people who you think are going to be supportive of projects. So you actually really want you know, a really great sphere of opinion and stuff. So you want to have people who are very tech savvy, you want to have people who are likely to be argumentative and detractors and that kind of thing. You want to involve junior and senior people. You want that broad spread of experience because that's when you're really going to kind of bottom down into what the problem is and actually what the pain points are and then to be able to look to solve them. You know, I'm, I'm quite conscious that obviously I have practiced as a lawyer. Um, you know, my, my time away from practice is now getting increasingly, increasingly larger and I don't want to kind of input my when I was in practice kind of mentality into everything because everything has changed even since I've practiced so that, you know, even using the knowledge, you've still got to step back. You've still got to ask the appropriate questions, listen um, and be empathetic to actually understand what the current problem is, not the one you had when you were last in practice, no matter how tempting that is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I wrote the book on de-skilling from being a lawyer. So so uh, <laughs> I, do, you, do you ever get people saying that to you? They'll say, oh, God, why did you come off the tools? Haven't you de-skilled? And I'll I'll say no, I've reskilled, and in and fact, it's skilled in an entirely different way. <laughs> def definitely, and and you know, what? I I still I'm really proud of the fact that I had a legal career. I'm still clinging on to my practice and certificate. 
But I, I like Me too. <laughs> yeah, I like being a lawyer. I like what we stand for. I like being in a profession where things like honesty and integrity are, are at the cornerstones. But it doesn't mean that that's all you can be. You know, there are certain parts of the legal training which can be cross-transferred. And of course, there's new things to be learned out there. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose the future probably of the legal profession is not just more bums on seats. It's not just filling rooms full of lawyers. It's diversifying. It's being able to have you know technology that can do part of the job or some of the mundane aspects. Um, and almost while you sleep, it can be either giving out advice or, you know, um, given a, given a, an outcome based on a, a, an appropriate risk level, that kind of thing. So all kind of new and different ways of of diversifying really the, the legal profession. And again, that all still though goes back to people. You need people to do all of that. You're just training them or using them in a, in a slightly different way. So it might not be the, the background or the experience they've had. But like you said, Simon, ma- massively transferable skills into other areas. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned there the role of the, of the lawyer moving forwards in, in in the face of this emerging artificial intelligence technology. So let's look to the future. I wonder if we sit, if we sit here in ten years' time, is it feasible that artificial intelligence will have developed to such an extent that it has replaced lawyers? Now, the reason why I'm I'm unsure on that, one of the reasons, is because a big part of being a lawyer is to to respond, it's to risk assess, it's to make predictions, it's to advise, it's to be nimble, it's to be empathetic with the client, it's to have a good bedside manner, all these really sort of humanistic traits. At this moment in time, or in terms of what you would foresee for the next 10 years, will machines be able to learn that more humanistic um, set of qualities that lawyers have to have? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the, the million dollar question, is it, Simon, and a, and a really interesting one. I suppose we're already seeing the profession train people much differently. So back in the day when I trained, it was the eye-shaped lawyer. So your eye was your if you imagine the shape was was your legal skills there was a little bit of what they call soft skills at the bottom but there wasn't a lot else the t-shaped lawyer came next if you imagine the t-shaped um crossbar that was kind of your problem solving skills you might have some bd you might have some client skills you might have lean six sigma or marketing skills and now we're very much on to this o-shaped lawyer so someone who is open-minded opportunistic all of those kind of qualities and that's got kind of real traction um, in the in the press in the the GC market, I think probably the technology will advance an awful lot faster than society in the profession um, actually kind of embed it within a in a law firm. So I've no doubt that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, the technology will be there that will be capable of doing all these kinds of things. But actually, I think the crunch point will come when we kind of step back as a society and as a profession and say, well, what should the tech be doing and what should a person be doing? And I think this is the approach we've tried to take um, at Waitman's really is to look, use the technology to do the heavy lifting bits, to do the mundane bits, but to actually do discrete tasks rather than replace the whole job of a lawyer. So yes, a piece of software can review a contract probably more accurately and quicker than a lawyer, but it's then not going to know what to do with all of that information. So that still comes to the lawyer who has all those skills you've you've discussed before, you know, who's empathetic, who understands the client's business and who is then able to give, a, you know, a, a reasoned um, piece of advice to the client based on that information that's come. And that's just using tech really where it should be to take you know, the boring or the mundane or the slow bits out of the process. I mean, I don't know if you've seen, Simon, this week, that chat GPT stuff has been all over LinkedIn. We were Um, talking about it earlier. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There's probably not a lawyer in the land who's not had a little play with it, kind of me included. Um, You know, and that technology, it's really, really clever, isn't it? You start to have a go. But I suppose it's like all these things. A little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. If you ask it a contract question and it comes back and it looks vaguely sensible, if you're not a lawyer, you're not going to know where to look. Um, You're not going to be able to corroborate that. And I did a post earlier this week on LinkedIn that I think the main, you know, these things are really useful, aren't these kind of research tools? So if if you've come into an area and you absolutely know nothing about it, 
asking it a question, it's a bit, I suppose, like Googling or shoving it on Wiki. It'll get you to broadly the area of law you want to use. Would you then go and stand up in court and say, you know, Your Honour, the answer came from Wiki? Well, no, you wouldn't, would you? Because you know that that's not a reliable resource. And that's part of being a lawyer is to be able to, you know, lawyers don't know the answer for everything. We, we know that, but we are trained in how to find good pieces of facts, good pieces of evidence, and to back that up. So knowing, you know, that you'd go on to a reputable, um, you know, legal database and look those things up and you know which textbook to have a look in and that kind of thing. So what kind of frightens me about some of this technology is as a lawyer, we'd all have a play like we have done and go, oh, that's, you know, that's interesting. It's got maybe one of the sentences right, but the rest is a bit random and you wouldn't rely on it. If you Joe blogs in the street and you've got no legal knowledge and it comes back looking to spout something that's vaguely correct, you're just going to assume that's correct. And I think that's the kind of the dangerous bit that we start to to get into. Have you had a play with the uh, with the chat GP? Well, do you know Simon? what? I, I haven't, but I've heard two different reports. I had a Jacob, our, our, our producer, was telling me earlier that he had another client in the podcast studio who asked it some questions. The, the, the client, I think, was in, in the investment business and asked um, it, the chatbot some questions about what the investment priority should be for 2023 and got a great answer. But then I was talking to a mate the other day and just completely off topic, I don't know if you're a football fan, but Croatia have done really well in this year's World Cup. And he asked the uh, the chat the chatbot, what is it? Chat, 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 GPT. Chat, GPT, GPT, GPT that's it. yeah. He asked it, why Croatia? had done so well in this World Cup. And it responded with a great answer about it's got a strong football heritage, it commits to youth um, youth training, um, it's got a population who love football. So we thought, that's amazing. Yeah. But then he thought, I'll give it another try and I'll ask the same question for Spain. Yeah. And the, the answer was exactly the same. <laughs> so you think to yourself, are people being sort of blinded by the science of it a bit? And who's... Who's checking the accuracy of the tech? So maybe that that, that 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 probably brings us into just the discussion on the risks of all of this. Because of course, risks are fundamental to how law is practiced. When we when we're dealing with client matters, we've always got in the back of our mind our, our ethical responsibilities, client care, and of course, professional negligence. And then if you throw in things like cyber risk. It's, this is not a, a straightforward or a risk-free process. So who 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 do we think is, is going to be responsible within a law firm setting for checking the accuracy of what artificial intelligence will do as this really exciting journey we've described progresses? Yeah, so I suppose the, the approach we've taken, I suppose going back to that kind of earlier point about kind of explainability of AI, we don't want to be in the kind of situation where it's computer says yes or no, and that's how decisions are made. And indeed, the GDPR doesn't. It allows people to opt out of decisions that are based entirely on, um, you know, not having a person involved and stuff. We've very much taken the approach that it's really human or lawyer in the loop so that there's always lawyer eyes on stuff. So even with that document review kind of technology we were talking about earlier, Simon, the technology will review the contract, the lease, the medical report, whatever it might be. But then the lawyer will still also look. The lawyer will probably have a quicker look because the, the main salient points have already been highlighted to them. But the lawyer will still go through and, and sense check um, as, as they go. And I think so tools around kind of decision support and those kind of things, they are all built when we build them with kind of change in mind. So we all know the legal profession and laws and that kind of stuff doesn't stay static. So we've always built stuff knowing that it will have to be capable of being refreshed and updated and having a process involving the lawyers who've helped create it in the first place, confirming, you know, at set intervals that the legal framework hasn't changed. It's still, um, you know, accurate with it within that. And I suppose you have to try and think of it really in the same way that you try and upskill your um, your people. So you make sure they have the CPD updates, you know, a new case comes out, everybody told about it. You have to think of the tech in the same way. It's not going to suddenly know there's been a Supreme Court case on something if you've not gone back and updated the rules that sit behind it. In the same way that a paralegal is probably not going to know that unless they've been to some training or had an email um, sent round. So I think some of it is kind of trying to compare apples with apples, isn't it? So, you know, there have been some quite interesting studies where 
there has been document review and the document review has been more accurate than a room full of lawyers. And I suppose that's what you would expect, isn't it? Because people define things differently. You know, people come in and they're tired or they're stressed or they're unwell and that kind of thing. And, you know, I suppose we almost put lawyers on a pedestal and say they are always, you know, 120% accurate, which of course we we always are. But I suppose you've got to have um, realistic expectations from the technology. And I suppose that was my earlier point about when you're trying to explain this technology, you should be saying not only what it will do, but what the limitations of it are. So if it won't do a particular type of document or it won't pick up handwriting or it's not to be used in this type of decision, have that really clear and upfront, um, you know, in the in the kind of the, the, the briefing a, a about it. I think what will be quite interesting over time, I mean, we were just chatting, weren't we, about that chat GPT, is if we've got a generation coming through where that is the norm, so I've got an eight-year-old son. By the time he's entering a, you know, a, a world of work, he'll have been doing his homework on that for, you know, and university essays and all that kind of stuff for donkey's years. Do they suddenly come into a profession and go, gosh, why does nobody use that? And I think that's the the really interesting bit that, you know, obviously we've got yet to come, but how society trusts you know, different um, levels of expertise or different ways of getting that expertise will be very much kind of live issues over the next kind of 10 or, or 20 years. I think so. Do you know what? It's interesting you mentioned doing doing the homework. I'm convinced, you know, that people will end up going to school in a virtual environment. I think it's an inevitability. I honestly do, you know. I mean, I, I know <laughs> I've, I've, I've learned a bit about the metaverse, but if I was going to say you'll be on the metaverse. Oh gosh, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I've not been. I've got my daughter one of those Oculuses for for Christmas, but I, I can think of lots of reasons why, in a in a legal setting, there could be real advantages to. I know we're onto a different area of tech in terms of the virtual world, but you know, for clients to be able to see their solicitor in the metaverse, for people to be able to attend legal conferences in the metaverse, court hearings virtually. Um, I can see lots of advantages. Um, and I think it's a, we're back to this issue, aren't we, of incremental change. And that's the one you've highlighted because quite often tech is sold as like a crisis purchase. It's like, what, you, you haven't got this? Oh my God, you, you need to get it. Whereas quite often, I think the best approach is look, we're practicing now, we're in business, we're looking after clients, we're making money, we're not in a bad position. Why don't we look at where we are and put a realistic, measured plan in place using tech as part of that to achieve better outcomes for everyone? So I would say to, to law firms and to lawyers, don't let tech scare you, don't let tech companies scare you. When they come around for these pitches and if they're saying, oh my God, you haven't got this yet, you really should get it right now, they're probably wrong because you, you're in a, a good situation where you can use this as a new facet to your business without viewing it as a crisis purchase. Yeah, no, definitely. I suppose I'm probably on a bit of a different different viewpoint on the, on the metaverse than you, so I don't really get it. I'm quite sceptical about it. I don't understand. I suppose I, I wasn't – I suppose I didn't play a lot of video games and that kind of thing growing up. So for me, it's a bit like just – I suppose Sim City or something. There was the game that was going around when I was little. It's kind of that, it's all that virtual living, and I'm like, why would you want to do that when you can actually go out and meet people? But I suppose we're getting some way there, aren't we? So obviously, COVID gave us virtual hearings for you know all kinds of court cases up and down the land and stuff. But whether I think we'll have little judges pinging in as avatars and all that kind of thing, I'm probably, I'm probably more sceptical on, on that front, Simon, than you are. <laughs> do, you, do you know what? We Because we've got a legal tech business in, in our group, and because they are all yeah. so switched on with the tech, <laughs> and they're all so, most of them are like mid-20s, and they, they all go on nights out in the metaverse. They, they date in the metaverse. I mean, I've got to say, I can do see you think it. That, do, you think that's, do you think that's a generational thing then? I think it's a generational thing, but I could see the advantages because I could have got myself a really good looking av avatar and had a bit, <laughs> bit more success at that stage in my life. <laughs> oh, Kat, it's been, it's been such a joy talking to you. Thank you so much for your company. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We've learned such a lot more about artificial intelligence in terms of where it is, where the tech is now, how it might develop, and the way you're positive about it.
And I've got to say credit to you, but also credit to Waitman's. I mean, obviously, you know, Spiring Group of Waitman's clients. We have been, well, since I was in short pants, I've, I've been a Waitman's client and we're, we're, we're very loyal, we're very loyal to you. But just, just to finish off, we ask all of our guests this. If, if, you, if a, a law firm or a lawyer is viewing or listening now who really wants to implement um, either artificial intelligence or tech generally in their business and they feel they're at a very embryonic stage now, What's your top tip? Yeah, so I suppose um, top tips are know the problem that you're trying to solve. Get that absolutely nailed. Don't just take it from the first person who gives you the problem. Ask around, see if it's a you know a, a wider spread problem or if you, you've captured all of it. Um, get your process correct. So you either might be changing an existing process or building a new one. Absolutely nail that because, like I said before, otherwise it's just you know faster chaos. And involve people who are going to be involved in using that technology um, from the very beginning. So get them involved early, get them having, you know, seeing demos or in, in giving feedback on on proposed changes and that kind of thing. So three things really, problem, um, process and people from the very off. And that, then that leads into the technology, which should really be the very kind of last thing that you're looking at. What a fantastic tip. And, and that hearts and minds phrase you used earlier, I think is, is, is encompasses all of those things, uh, doesn't it? And just to finish off, Kat, thank you so much again for your expertise today. Thank you for your company. And uh, thank you to everyone for watching and listening. We're back every other Wednesday on From the Courtroom to the Boardroom. Until then, take care, speak to you soon. <laughs>